All right, good morning everyone and welcome to day 52 of our C sharp programming class. Um, <clears throat> today's going to be a little bit different and I'll explain it right now. As it says right there, we're going to go over chapter 17 and 18 of the Muroc text, but I'm going to flip them. I'm going to do chapter 18 first and then I'm going to do chapter 17. The reason for that is for chapter 17, the only thing that you have to do is the written test. All right, so I'm not, I, I don't mean to downplay it, but I guess I am in that it's not as important as chapter 18 is. Now, what we're doing now is we're going into a new section of the book, just so you know that. All right, and 17 and 18 are the new section. And then we go into the last part of the book, which is 19, 20, 21, and 22. But there's a big tie-in between chapter 18, which is on link, talk about it just a bit, and chapters 19 through 22. All right. So as it says in here, I'm gonna I am gonna go over both chapters and I'm going to do the exercise for chapter 17 that deals with text files, and I'm going to do the exercise for chapter 18 that deals with link. Both of those will be put out onto a um, GitHub repository later today. All right, for chapter eight, 18, I should say, there will be, in addition to the written test, a homework assignment. I do have the homework assignment, and I'll send it out in my later email today. All right, now a couple last things, then we're going to get started. It appears as though everyone who's in the class, all 12 of you who are in the class, have turned in hot number seven, which is your last hands on test. We can all be happy for that. All right, some people turned it in literally the day that was given last Friday. Some people turned it in late yesterday, regardless. And I hope to be able to start grading that tonight. I will tell you though tonight what we do at Rankin one time a year is we have what's what's called an advisory committee meeting. And when we have that, we have people from business and industry come in and let us know what's working and what's not working in the programs, in the IT programs. Well, we had that one already, but one thing that, that makes Rankin unique, and I think it's a really good thing, is we have another advisory committee meeting, and that one is called an alumni advisory committee meeting. And what that is, is we invite people who have graduated in the last maybe one to five years who are employed in the field to come in and they tell us. Basically, Evan, who runs the meeting, my boss, asks about three or four questions. He said, what, what did we teach here at Rankin in the AWD program that you use on a regular basis? What did we teach here in the Rankin AWD program that you don't use on a regular basis? What do you wish we would be teaching that we're not teaching in the Rankin AWD program? And what do you, you know, what, what aren't, are we teaching that you think we don't have to teach? That meeting is tonight. And it's going to be probably from about 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. All right, so I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to start grading your tests tonight. If I can't, I'll start them tomorrow. All right. <clears throat> For your homework, I've decided, and I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, it's time to be really honest here. I did the one for you in class, the letters one, because I'd done that already. I did the one for you, with you, whatever you want to say on the photos, because I'd done that one already. I had never done this bank login enhanced, and I don't think it's right that I'm assigning it when I haven't done it. I had people emailing me over the weekend asking me this question and that question, and I really, in some ways, didn't know how to answer it because I had never done it. So what I'm going to do later this week is I'm going to upgrade my copy of the chapter 12 bank login, make it an enhanced login. I'm going to do all this and uh, I will email it to you at that time. The reason I'm telling you that is what that means is you do not have to do problem number three. All right, 
just turn in your written tests for chapter 14, your written test for chapter 16, and then problems one and two from the homework. All right. Finally, as it says here, there will be no class Friday if, if you're, you know, you call it whatever you want. Call it Good Friday, call it fall break or spring break, whatever you want. We don't have a regular spring break here where you get a week off like you get in, in other schools. All right. The decision was made a couple of years ago to forego the spring break and only give off the day that the, the Friday before Easter. And the reason for that is the semester ends on May 3rd. So people who are graduating this semester, yeah, there are graduates, people who are graduating, they've got a little bit of a jump on most people who are going out to look for jobs. All right, because there's they're they're graduating a little bit early in the game. OK, all right. Finally, and again, you might look at this and go, well, wait a minute, we're going over that today. Yes. And that is due. That homework will be due two weeks from yesterday. So you have no homework that's due on Easter Sunday. All right. So for those of you who have family, friends, other obligations, no, you won't have to worry about turning in anything. All right. OK, so with that said, let's get into this. And like I said, I'm going to go over chapter 18 first, and then I'm going to go over chapter 17. Do I have to do it like that? Of course not, but it's just the way I've decided to do it, be it right or wrong. All right, so chapter 18, as you can see on your screen right now, and hopefully I'm, I'm showing it on the screen. All right, it says I'm sharing. It's on how to use LINK. LINK is actually an acronym. It stands for Line Integrated Query, or Language Integrated Query, or Line Integrated Query. It depends on the book you read. But when we get into, when we get into chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22, we'll be working with databases. All right, why am I bringing that up now? Because you can use link to work with databases and we will eventually do that but you can use link and basically take something like an array and treat it as though it was a database link is something that was created by microsoft it's a neat product all right so as it says this chapter does not focus on databases because we haven't talked about them yet so we'll talk about how to use link with what are called in-memory data structures, things like arrays and lists. When we get to chapter 20, we'll learn how to use link with arrays. All right. This is neither one of these chapters, 17 or 18, are particularly long. There are both under 25 pages. So as you can see, this is split up into about four sections. We'll first discuss basic concepts for working with link. Then we'll talk about how to code query expressions. And there's two ways that you can do this when you're working with link. You can use query expressions or you can use method based queries. We'll talk about both. All right. Finally, there is a customer service or invoice applications that uses generic lists and you use link with that application. So please don't let what we're talking about in here throw you and think, oh my God, I'll never get this. It's I'm not going to say that it's easy, but it's about as hard as you make it. Tomorrow what we'll do is we're going to go over an example and we're really, really going to take our time. We're going to build a um, a console program. Yeah, it's been a while since we've done a straight console program, but we're going to build that tomorrow. There's a few other things we're going to do tomorrow. I don't want to talk about them right now. Maybe I'll mention them to you at the end of class. So this book calls link language integrated query for whatever reason. I've heard it called line integrated query also. As it says, it allows you to query a data source using C sharp. What does that mean? That means that you can use link 
to ask questions to a program. All right. Now, I was even thinking about this and I thought maybe it would make more sense to show you the kind of thing that we're going to do. So if you'd bear with me for a second, and again, if 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 you look at this and go, oh my God, I'll, I'll never get this. Yeah, you will. I'm going to show you first what we're going to build tomorrow. All right. And again, you'll get all of this code. I'm not going to save it to a, a repo, but you'll watch me do it tomorrow. So let's see. We've got here somewhere in here. There it is. All right, let me just close all this stuff. All right, so we're going to run this program and it's going to look like this. Comes up with a big menu. All right, we're going to have a list of about 20 employees. I'll give you that stuff. Each employee will have an address. Each employee will live in a different or in a city. They're all, uh, some of them are in Illinois and some of them are in um, Missouri. They'll all have their own zip code. So we'll be able to list all the employees, as it says, in ascending order based on their last name. Then we do it in ascending order based on their address. Then ascending on city, ascending on state, ascending on zip code. Then, as it says, by last name criteria. So I just want to show you this quickly. So if I put a one in here, this says show me all 20 employees based on their last name. And if you look in here, I know it's real ugly, but when you look at the last name, Adams, Black, Brown, Bryant, et cetera, you'll notice that it's in alphabetic order. All right, that's what I want you to notice here. It is in alphabetic order. All right, so that's what happens if we do that. OK, and if I run it again and I do a two, now it's an order by address. One, two, three, one, four, five. You might say, well, that's not an order. It actually is. And we'll talk about what that means in another time. All right. Then if we run it again and we put a three in there, you'll notice it's by city. There's Belleville. There's Highland. There's St. Louis. All right. So that's all again in order. I wanted to do it again, sorry. So let me stop that and start it again. All right, I think those probably make sense. And then here where you've got this by last name criteria, okay? Let's put in a six. All right, enter an employee whose last name to search for, full or partial. Well, if we take a look at what's in here, and I'll have to do it this way. These are going to be our employees. These are the 20 employees, all right? So you'll notice if we look in here as an example, we've got Doe, Smith, Kramer, Adams, James, et cetera, all right? And you'll notice as an example, we've got Ben Jones and we've got Dick Jones. All right. So if I come in here and run this program and I say J O N E S, notice that it finds them. It finds there's Ben Jones and there's Dick Jones. I'll try to play with the formatting on here so it looks a little nicer before tomorrow. But you again, hopefully get the idea. We're asking this, this system to either give us all the information or just some of the information. If I say show me by city and I type in Belleville, hope I'm spelling that right. I guess I did. You'll notice Belleville, 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 Belleville. This is what we're going to be working on for the rest of the semester. All right. And what I mean is we're going to have data sources. We're going to have some data. And we want to be able to ask questions of that data. The other program that we're going to do, and we're going to do this one on Wednesday, just so you see it. And again, we'll do this together. I, I, I'm planning on spending the whole period on this. All right, so let me close this. 
it's gooey, but you, you look at it, you almost think it's not. All right. I've come up with 75 songs. And we want to be able to show all of the songs by title, by artist, or by genre. So notice if I do it by title, you can see when you look in here that it, they're in alphabetic order. All right. If I come back in again and do it by artist, again, they're in alphabetic order. If I do it again, based on genre, alphabetic order by genre, and then I can also go in and ask questions. So if I search by artist and I come in here, it's going to say, OK, give me an artist name. All right, and there's the two songs in there by Garth Brooks as an example. So this is what we're going to be going through in this chapter. We're going to talk about how to do this. All right, we will further refine this when we get to chapter 20. We're actually going to build a database together. Mr. Gudmistead has built a database and it's there's nothing wrong with it, except I don't agree with the way he did it. So we're going to refine it to make it the way I think it should have been. And it, there's just some superficial changes I'm going to make to it. All right, but then we're going to work with that as well. All right, hopefully whoever was trying to get in here Good, you're all, it looks like you're all able to get in here. Good, all right. So again, if you just did join, I'm gonna do chapter 18 first, then I'm going to go back and do chapter 17. Chapter 18 will have homework associated with it. Chapter 17 will just have the written test. All right, so we're talking about LINK, Language Integrated Query, and it allows you to query or ask questions to a data source. In this chapter, our data source is going to be either a list or an array. When we get to chapter 20, the data source will become a database. Don't worry about a database right now. All right. They go through here and they talk about how Link is implemented. And this is, you know, kind of a behind the scenes type of thing. All right. But the, the key thing there is, if you notice, it says they're defined by the enumerable and, and queryable classes. Well, the thing is about those, just so you know, is again, Link is an entire Microsoft product. When we get to chapter 19 and we start talking about databases, we're not only going to talk about Link, we're also going to talk about something that's called SQL or structured query language. SQL works solely with databases. Link can work with databases and it can work with data sources like arrays and lists. So in, in some ways, at least, it's more powerful. And they start to come in here and give you some of, some of the advantages of using Link all right, and they show them on the page here. It says makes it e easier for you to query a data source by integrating the query language with C sharp. What the heck does that even mean? When we get to chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22, what you're going to notice when we get there is we're going to use some stuff we haven't talked about in here all semester. When you look in this box here, all semester, this has been our toolbox, all right? And that's there's nothing wrong with that, that's correct. But you can also click view and put in, if you look here, there's something called, for example, an SQL Server Object Explorer. And in there, you can work with databases. So we're going to be working with databases and our programs. But to kind of ease our way into it, we're gonna start with link. Now, what it says by integrating the query language with C Sharp, what that means is that when you go and write link statements, you'll have IntelliSense like we've had all semester. And if you make a mistake, it'll show. So if you've got some kind of an error like we've done before, like leaving off a semicolon or spelling something wrong, et cetera, it'll be caught. All right. So that's what they talk about in here. It says it also makes it easier for you to query different types of data. 
like I said, things like arrays and lists. All right. Now, we'll go back in just a second. I'm going to go back a page, but it says there it makes it easier for you to use objects to work with relational data sources by using an object relational mapping network. That's what we're going to get into more in chapter chapters 19 through 20, just so you're aware of that. So like I said, there'll be a lot of new terminology and stuff that's in here. And if it doesn't totally make sense, please don't let that throw you. All right. As it says, the key to making all this work is that the query language, so link, which is a query language, is integrated right into C sharp. All right. It says, finally, if you're working with a relational data source, such as SQL Server database, which we will work with, in chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22. It says you can use an ORM framework like Entity Framework Core. We'll look into that when we get into chapter 20. All right, and we'll use that in, in unison with using Link. All right, so it's all stuff that you're going to see. Now, when we come in and we start writing Link queries, and again, a query is just, you know, a question. OK, I, I just I want to show you something and it probably won't make a load of sense right now, which is totally fine. But imagine right here, imagine that I had a bunch of data right here. I'm going to make this a little bigger so you can see it. All right. And let's just say I had this. I'm going to put in five names. Mike Jones. Ken Green. Mary Smith. Uh, Martin King and Barb Coates. Okay, so I've got these five names. What we will learn in chapter 20 and 19 and 20 is if I wanted to see all this information, so maybe I'm, I'm just showing you names, maybe they had addresses, cities, states, etc. I would say something like this select star from and let's say that the name of this was employees so from employees all right there's a reason i'm showing you this okay this says go to the employees database table we're assuming that's what this is and show me everything that's in there all right okay fine and danny why am why am i even showing you this well what if i i wanted to show you all the employees but only Let's just say we wanted to show the female employees. Now, that, that, that sounds sexist. I don't want it to. Let's say that for each employee, we had a salary. All right. So we wanted to say where salary greater than or equal to $75,000. So every you know, we go through these five people, and let's say that Mike Jones was making $60,000 that Ken Green was making $70,000, or $70, that Mary Smith was making $80,000, that Martin King was making $90,000, and that Barb Coates was making $100,000. So then when we ran this query, it would only show these three people. Because what we're putting on here is basically, we're saying that we wanna take our results and we want to funnel them. In other words, we, we only want certain things to show. So if we do this, just this part, it's going to show all five of these people. But if we do it like this, it's only going to show the bottom three. So who cares? Why am I even showing you that? Well, if you notice, when you write SQL, okay, just so you know, when you write SQL like this, you write select and you use from and you use where, and there's a few other things. There's all things that you're gonna learn. The reason I'm showing you this is if I write this same query in link, I say from employees where salary greater than or equal to 75,000 select star so you can see in a way i mean in in very many ways it's the same thing but we're changing the order around 
And I believe one of the reasons that Microsoft did this is because this right here will work with SQL. This will not. All right, this will not work with link. This will. So we're basically doing the same thing. All that we're doing in here is we're changing around our order of operations. All right, so you're going to learn how to do it like this now. Then when we get to chapter 19, we're going to do it like this, and we'll actually end up in sometimes doing it in both ways. But the point is, you're getting the same data regardless of how you do it. All right, okay. So you can read this stuff yourselves here. I, I don't want to sit and, and read everything that's in here in the book to you. This is going to be important a little bit later in the chapter, and that is that you can write link methods in two ways. You can write what are called method based queries, and you can write what are called query expressions. All right, it says you use a method based query or query expression to identify you know, what you want to retrieve. All right, what I showed you over here. All right, what I showed you over here in this example, this is a query based expression. The method ones we'll get into in just a little bit. All right, OK. All right, the three stages of a query operation. So what what the heck does that mean? It means that when you are sitting there and you are planning it, so if you've got some data source, maybe you've got an array with a thousand employees in it or a list would be better because again you can add and remove employees so let's say you had a list with a thousand employees all right that would be stage one that would be getting your data source that'll be the thing that contains our data then the second stage as it says right here is to define the query so you have to figure out what it is you're looking for. All right. And again, when we looked over here at this, remember, had we not had a had had we not had this, if we just said from employees select star, we'd get everybody. So we'd get all five of these employees. That's just like if we said this, select star from employees, the same kind of thing. All right. But in either way, we are going to be coming in here and we're going to be using a data source. And again, in this chapter, the data source will be a list or an array. So why am I spending all this time telling you this? Because for lack of better words, the example that they're going to give on the next page, sorry for my English, but it kind of sucks. It's not really what I call a, a really good example. All right. Now it says here that when you write a query expression, you typically store it in a query variable. All right, so in other words, what I showed you right here wasn't complete in this one here. You typically would put that, the results of that, you would put it into a variable. All right, and the reason for that is you can define it and then maybe not want to execute it right away. And as it says there, the query is not executed when it's defined. All right. And again, you're hearing a lot of new terms here. And if it doesn't make a lot of sense, that's really to be expected. All right. We're going to look at their example that they have again, albeit a simple one on the next page. So in step one, you figure out what your source of data is going to be. In step two, you define what you want to ask for. And in step three, you actually write the operation to execute the query. And there's different ways that you can do it. All right. Now, when you save it into a query variable, which is what they're going to talk about, that's called deferred execution. If you look at the bottom paragraph here, what that means is you can print out the results when you want to by giving the value of that variable. If you don't want to use deferred execution, if you want to run it right away, it's called immediate execution. All right. 
So let's take a look at the example that they show in here. So again, these are the three steps. So here in step one, we've got a pretty simple array with five numbers in it. It's an integer array, and it has the number zero, one, two, three, and four in it. You can see we've got a deferred execution here because we're saving the results and we're saving the results into a variable that's called number list. Notice when we do that, we're using the word var. All right. In this case, all right, in this case, we're we're saving integers. But we could have another one where we were saving strings or saving booleans or something else. So what you do in here is you don't say int number list, you say var. And when you use var, what happens is the system looks at what it is you're doing and it says, oh, those are integers. So number list is going to hold integers. All right, so it figures out the data type for you. So here is step one where we're getting our data source. Here is step two where we're defining the query. And here is step three where we're running the query. All right. And when you look at that, okay, it says for each var number in number list, what that's doing is it's taking zero and it's dividing it by two. And it says, does it have a remainder of zero? Yes, it does. So that comes as part of the list. All right. They take one and divide it or modulo it by two. Is the remainder zero? No, so that's skipped. We take two and modulo it by two. Is the remainder zero? Yes, so now zero and two are in our list. We take three and we modulo it by two. Is the remainder zero? No, so we skip that one. All right, then finally we take four and we modulo it by two. Is the result zero? Yes. So we've got zero, two, and four in here, and we wanna order our results in descending order. So rather than saying zero, two, and four, we're saying four, two, and zero, all right? And I mean, let's face it, this is a pretty doggone simple example, but just so you know, if we had a list, for example, of a thousand different numbers, and we wanted to know which were even and which were odd, the only thing we would have to change would be this. Rather than having a new integer array with just those numbers in it, maybe we already had an array, maybe it had grades in it. All right, and one of the things we could check, so let's say that we had grades in it, and the grades went from zero to 100. And if you get a 75 or above, you pass. And if you get a 75 or a 74.9 or below, you fail. So we could come in there then if we had that list of grades and just change this criteria. We could say where grade is greater than or equal to 75, for example. All right. And then what we'd have in there would be all the students who passed. And if we put them in descending order, it would go from 100 down to 75. If we checked in here and said where grades is less than 75, that would have all the people who failed. All right, so here we're identifying our data source. Here we're identifying the query we want to run. And in this for each statement, we're actually running the query. So those are our three stages in here as far as what it is we want to do. And again, it's called deferred execution. Because we don't run the query, we, we set it up here, but we don't run the query until right there. Okay. All right. Since the query wasn't executed when it was defined, it's stored in a query variable. So number list is a query variable, rather. You can also do it as immediate execution. Why would you want to use an immediate execution? Well, what if what if all I wanted to know in here, what if all I wanted to know was a count of the number of people who passed? Then boom, all that that's not going to return something like this. It's going to return something like let's say nine out of twelve people 
passed. It's just going to return nine. So we probably wouldn't need to set up a deferred execution. We could do an immediate execution or something like that. So it's not saved in a query variable. All right. So you may or may not remember, but at the beginning of the chapter, so right here, when we were starting to talk about this, all right, so we went in and we went through a couple of the basic concepts. I showed you how link was implemented. I talked about a couple of the advantages. We just looked at the three stages. All right, but now we're going to look at the two different types of link queries you can write. One of them is called query query expression, and one of them will be called a method based query. All right, so we're going to look at both of those right now. And again, I think this book makes a lot of assumptions is when it says something like this. You might say, well, you just you've spent the last half hour throwing this stuff at us and I sort of understand what you're talking about, but not really. All right, so they're going to jump in now and they're going to say you need to learn the syntax for coding these different kinds of expressions. That's what we're going to talk about right now. I've already started to show you those because as it says here, to identify the source of the data, you use the from clause. Where are you getting your data from? All right. As it says, this clause declares a range variable that'll be used to represent everything that you have in the data source. So they're going to show some examples in here. Let's Rather than going through this, let's take a look at the example and then we can come back. All right. So if you look right here, we've got a decimal array with one, two, three, four sales totals. You can see them yourselves. I'm not going to read them off. All right. And what this is going to do, when you look right here, this is going to take sales list and it's going to put each total in it. All right. So it'll add all four of these. That's what's going to be held in here. Then when we go to execute the query, what we care about, and I would have put that in the, in the, into um, curly braces, but they didn't. This is going to add the four up. So the result of sum will be 128645 plus 243349 plus 2893.85 plus 2094.53. That's what sum is going to hold. All right. Now notice what they have here. Wow. Here's a class. All right, it says an example of a generic list of invoices as the data source. So rather than using an array, we can get the information if we want to or need to out of a class. All right, so in this class, each invoice has an invoice ID. It has a customer ID. It's the customer associated with that invoice. It has the date the invoice was written, the product total, the sales tax, the shipping amount, and the invoice total. Well, you can see it's getting a little bit more complex in here. All right. And what I mean is now we're working with a list. All right. And so what? Well, now notice what you can use with VAR. VAR invoices, we can tell it to go through each invoice that's in here, select it. So if we had 50 invoices in here, it would give us all of them. And this is going to add the total up of all the invoices, whether there's only one invoice, whether there's 10 invoices, 100 invoices, or whatever. All right, so this is pretty strong and powerful stuff. All right. So as they mentioned there, the from clause identifies the source of the data. All right. And if you go back, so if that confused you, I'd suggest, suggest rather going back and looking at the text that goes with this. As it says, it's showing you how to use the from clause with an array of decimals. It says at this point, you should realize a query expression always starts with the word from. 
followed by where you're getting the data from. And that's going to be the case whether you're getting the data from an array, from a list, or from a database. All right. Also, it must end with either a select clause or a group clause. Don't worry about groups right now. We're going to get into them. All right. And select is giving you what you want. So in that first example, it's pretty simple. Then in the second example, like we just looked at, you're working with a class. We're going to do both of these. All right. So you get ex exposure and experience with both. And you might say, OK, I, I sort of understand what you're talking about. Can you tell me if you would, you know, why? Why are we even doing this? Those of you where this is your second class, so if you've already taken the AWD 1100 class, then in summer, you will be taking the AWD 1115 class. All right, that is Database Driven Web Development 2. In that class, you'll continue to work with C Sharp. All right, but as you're working with C Sharp, rather than what writing desktop applications like we've been doing all semester and will continue to do you're going to write web applications so rather than it running on your desktop it can run in a browser all right and almost the entire class i think it's like from chapter three on all of your inputs all of the data that you'll be getting you'll be getting and you'll be using databases all right, and that's why you're getting exposed to this right now. All right, all right. Filtering results, that was the word I was looking for before and couldn't find it. So when you look right here at the example we looked at, all right, we're using filtering. If all we said was select star from employees, we're not filtering anything. We're saying, give me everybody. But here we're filtering with a where clause. The where clause says, we only want the ones that meet that criteria. That's what a where clause does. It filters out the data. I gave you a different example previously. If we had a, a hundred exam scores and I wanted to find out who passed, then our where clause would be where test grade is greater than or equal to 75. All right. So you start these queries with the word from you end these queries with either the word select or the word group. We're not worrying about group right now, but in between the from and the select, if you need to put criteria in here, you put it in a where clause. And these where clauses can be as complex as you need them to be. So if you remember earlier, just a couple minutes ago, we looked at this. Remember these numbers. OK, let's copy them and let's put them down below here. So there's our four numbers. OK, in fact, we'll just do it like this. All right, so those are our four numbers right there. All right, why am I showing them to you? I'll tell you right now. Because when you look in here, now we're putting in a where clause and in that where clause let me move this way the hay over all right in that where clause what we're asking for in there is only only the times where our totals are greater than 2000 so you'll notice this one is not going to be included in the list we have filtered the data. So if we said, just give us the ones that are greater than 2100, that one wouldn't be in here, and neither would that one. Now, one thing to realize about this is sometimes when you run a query like this, you'll get back nothing. So if I came in here and said, show me all the sales that are greater than 3000, it wouldn't show me anything because there aren't any in just the same way. If these are my employees right here. And I said, show me all employees making over a million dollars. 
There's nothing wrong with the query, but there'd be no data that would satisfy the query itself. So what I'm telling you is sometimes when you run queries, you'll get back nothing. That's not an error. That just means there was no data that met your criteria. There's a difference between those two. All right. So if I say, you know, show me how many people make over a million dollars and it comes back with none, what I know is the query is OK, but I know nobody is making over a million dollars a year. All right. So they've got another example here where they've got a list of invoices that are greater than $150. And you'll notice that every one of the ones in here is more than 150. Now, they didn't do any sorting in here, so there's no order by clause like you saw before. All right, so if they had done this query right here, let's grab that query, copy it, let's bring it over here. All right, so we've got var invoices equal this, where this, select this. If we had come in here and said, order by, and we said, you know, invoice dot invoice total, something like that. And let's say we did that and we said descending. All right, so let's assume for a second that we had written that. All right, then what's going to happen, move that over a bit. All right, so you can see it right here. Make it a little bit, a little smaller so you can read everything. All right, so if we did this, we would have the same things that are here, but the first one you'd see would be 654.63, then 317.81, then 259.05, etc. Because here, we're filtering. Here, we're changing the order in which we're displaying things. If we did it in ascending order, it would go from smallest to largest, but I wrote it with descending, so it'll go from largest to smallest. All right, so as it says there, the where operator lets you filter data. The condition is coded as a Boolean expression. That's what this is. Where invoice dot invoice total greater than 150. Where sales greater than 2000. Those are Booleans. They either are or they're not. Now they're going to come in here and they're going to talk to you again about sorting. It's kind of weird, and don't ask me why, but Microsoft decided that when you did your order by like this, they made order by a single word. Why am I telling you that? Because when we get to the SQL part in chapters 19 through 22, order by will be two words. Why did Microsoft decide to make it one word when SQL makes it two words? I have no idea. All right. But again, we're asking for the sales greater than 2000 here. All right, so there they are in this particular example. All right, so here they come in and notice they, you know, is there any sorting? You say, no, there's not, yes, there is. It's sorted by customer ID in a setting order. All right. So as it says there on the bottom of the page, the order by clause lets you specify how results are sort sorted. You can specify one thing or you can specify multiple things. Now, going back to the example that we had up here, what if we had also, let's say that Mike's wife, Betty, also works here. Okay. What's, which one is going to show first, Mike Jones or Betty Jones? You actually don't know. But I could, when I, if I did a sort, I could sort it by last name. Then I could say comma first name. And then Betty would come before Mike because B comes before M. That would be putting in multiple sorting criteria. 
totally legit to do that. All right. Now, if you only want certain fields from the query, all right, if you don't want everything that there is, so again, we're, we're imagining here, I'm keeping it simple, but what if we had in here also an address, a city, a state, and a zip code for each one of these people? Then when we did the select star, we'd be getting all that for everybody, all right? But if we only want some, some stuff, so just the first name and the salary, first name, last name, and salary, we're creating what's called a projection. So we're saying, don't show us everything, just show us what we want to see. All right. So if you look at this example right here, here they've got a sorted list. We haven't really dealt much with those, but they work with keys and values. Anderson made 1286.45. Menendez made 2433.49. Thompson made 2893.85, and Wilkinson made 2094.53. All right, so when we run this, we're asking for sales greater than 2,000. All right, put, put them in there. All right, and all we're asking for in here is to just display the name of the employee. All right, just the employee's name. We don't care how much. We just care. These are the three employees out of the four that had sales over $2,000. All right, this is a little confusing down here, but as it says, that's a query expression that creates an anonymous type. And if something is anonymous, that means it's not named. All right. So it says here, the select clause indicates the data you want to return. A query that returns anything other than everything that's in there is called a projection. To return two or more fields, you typically code an object initializer. You're going to see this as we go on. And again, I realize this. I know that last year when we went over this stuff, I remember students were just very, 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 confused. All right, let's talk about this and then we're almost ready to take our break. All right, there's about 10 pages left in the chapter. I wouldn't mind trying to finish this before our break. So the next thing is called a join for two or more data sources. I'm going to give you another example. All right, we're going to assume in here we're going to grab our five employees. I'm going to get rid of that address city state in just a second. All right, but I'm going to hit enter a bunch of times here so I can come down here. All right. So let's suppose that we have three different departments where we work. So we've got a web programming. All right. We've got a programming. And we've got an accounting. All right. And we'll just grab these. I, I'm just arbitrarily doing this. It doesn't have any meaning to it. All right, so those are people's first name, their last name, their salary, and the department you work they work for. Now imagine that we had thousands of employees. All right, we're going to imagine that we had thousands of employees. The chances of everybody typing that in in a correct manner are probably a lot smaller than you think. Some people might type in web, some people might type in PGMM for programming, et cetera. They might put ACCT for accounting. So, so that can be kind of tough. What if we did this? What if we created another table where number one, let's just say, was accounting. Number two, we're going to say was programming. And number three was Web. In fact, let's change it from web programming. Let's just make it web design. All right. So number three will be whoops, web design like that. All right. What did that buy us? Well, now we can come over here and make that a one. 
and make that a one and make that a one. And we can take that and make that a two. And we can take that and it also be a two. And then this would be a three. OK. So what we've done is we've separated our data out into two different data sources. All right. What is that bias? Well, there's going to be a lot less typing in this one now, and we only have to put in the word accounting once, the word programming once, and the word web design once, or the words web design. Now, what happens is our boss comes up to us and says, Jeff, I want you to write me up a, a report, and I want each person's, all I want is their first name, their last name, and the department they work for. Now let's assume that the, the, the boss doesn't know that one is accounting, that two is programming, and that three is web design. Or maybe we have a lot more numbers than that. Maybe we've got shipping and receiving and a bunch of other stuff. All right. Then what I have to do is I have to grab these two pieces of information from this table and then this piece of information from another table. And then what I have to do is refer to as join those two things together. That's what a join is. When you've got more than one data source and you need to grab information from more than one data source, you use what's called a join. All right, we're going to talk a little bit about joins now, but we'll talk a lot more about joins when we get to writing SQL in chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22. All right. So what happens there? Well, it starts to get ugly because you've got to do this. This is what joins everything together. All right. Now, what I didn't show you is when you want to join things together like this, you need to have something in common. Well, looky, three, two, one, two, one, one, and one, two, three. So this would be something like a department number. And so would this. So we'd be joining on something that's in common between these two. So in this case, we'd be joining on something like an employee number. Now that's what they show you here, but the example is fairly complex. So I wanted to show you something that at least hopefully would be a little bit easier for all of you to understand. All right. Now, are we going to do really, 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 really hard things? Somewhat. All right. And that's, that's all I can tell you right now. So as it says here, the join clause lets you combine data from two or more data sources, but there has to be a way of matching what those have. All right. And the example they showed there, believe it or not, was actually a fairly, fairly simplistic example. All right. So let's go through this because this is the other part in here. And this is talking about method based queries. It's not a long section in here, it's about three or four pages. We'll do this, we'll take a break. We'll come back and look at the example that's in the chapter. Then I will go over the example that's in the extra exercises. When I get done with that, we'll start on chapter 17. All right. OK. So it says. When you what we just did was we did what are called expression queries. But there's another kind of query you can write with link that use what are called extension methods. All right, the ones we just did were actually easier. All right, these are harder ones to write, and we're going to use what are called lambda expressions, and that's that equal sign followed by a greater than sign when you look right here. So they're coming back right here, and they're basically writing the same kinds of queries that we saw before. All right but they look harder because there's more stuff with them. All right, what do I mean? Well, look right here. 
instead of writing where, we've got where, but we need to put something in the parentheses. Instead of order by, now there's an order by, an order by descending, then by, then by descending, and our select and our join also have parentheses. So you're being much more explicit when you write these. All right. What we're going to do, what we are going to do when we get to about chapter 19 or 20 is we're going to have something where we're going to build a program. All right. And the program will actually be designed for us to write SQL statements. But after we write these, we're going to we're going to write about 30 or 40 queries. You're going to get all of them. We're going to do this together. All right, then we're going to go back and we're going to rewrite all 30 or 40 SQL queries that we do. And we're first going to go back and we're going to rewrite those. As expression based link queries like we just finished up with, then we're going to go back and write all 40 of these queries as method based queries. That's when I believe it's going to really start to make sense to you when you start to see the different ways of doing something. Until then, it's just, wow, you're throwing a lot of stuff at us and this isn't all that easy. No, it's not. All right. Now there's other things that you can do with this and they're gonna show you a couple of them in here. Okay, I'm not gonna read any of these. You can take a look at them yourselves. I will tell you that these that are right here the count, the average, the sum, the max, and the min. Those, not always, but typically, those are going to work with, num with numbers. You can use max and min. You can use them with non-numeric values. All right? So, for instance, if I used max and min with last name, the min last name would be Coates, and the max last name would be Smith. That's not usually how they're used, but they can be. So we're going to talk about these. And then we're going to start getting into this. This first, first or default, et cetera, you're going to use those a lot in the AWD 1115 class. All right. So you'll be exposed to these here. But if they don't totally make a boatload of sense to you right now, believe it or not, that's to be expected. All right, so they have some examples here and we're going to take a look at them. All right, not this second, but there's a few other things. There's skip, skips over some elements. Take, gets the specified number begin, you know, to begin with. To list, this is going to be probably eventually when you get into the AWD 1115 class, that'll be probably the most important one that you work with is to list. This first just says, show me the first one. First or default says, show me the first one. If there isn't one, show me whatever we set up as a default value. All right. Single expects that there's only one thing. So if I was doing something in here, let's just say, and I would, I, let's say I also had in here an employee number. All right. So let's just, you know, you know if we made up employee numbers here, and I said, as an example, if this was one, two, three, four, and then this one was two, three, four, five, and then this one was three, four, five, six, and then this one was four, five, six, seven. You're getting the idea, hopefully. And then this next one would be five, six, seven, eight, and then finally six, seven, eight, nine. All right, so why am I showing you this? Well, what does that have to do with what we're talking about? All right, well, when you start to take a look in here and you talk about skipping, et cetera, and you talk about single, if I would say return the employee with an ID of three, four, five, six, we're expecting there's only one employee with that ID. If we said return all employees, with an employee number greater than 3,000, there would be multiple ones. So if I try using that single that we just looked at 
that single and it returns more than one thing, we get an error. It's only expecting one thing. These are all things that probably don't make a boatload of sense to you right now, and hopefully will make more sense to you as we go on. All right. All right. We've only got four or five pages. I'm going to stop right here. It is 910, it looks like. So let's come back at 920. We'll finish up this chapter. I'll be back in just a couple minutes. <clears throat>
<clears throat> All right, it is 920, so I'm going to continue on again. We've got about four or five pages left in the chapter. When we get done, I'm going to go over the extra exercise and I'm going to show you kind of the before and after pictures. All right, so you can hopefully just start to, to get a feeling as to what's going on here. So it says the next two topics present a simple application that uses a query to display customer and invoice information on a form. This should help you see how to how do you work with queries. So figure 1810, as it says, shows the user interface for the customer invoice application. So if we look at that, there it is. Now this control that's right here, this control is known as a list view. We're going to end up using one of those on Wednesday. So don't really worry about it right now, but it just is a way that you can kind of set up information the way you want. All right, and if you look right here, you'll notice that there are two customers in this list of customers, and those are Sarah Cumberland and Kathy De La Fuente. They both have more than one invoice. Every other customer that you see in here, I'm not going to list them, you can see them, they have only one invoice. All right. Well, what we're able to do with the list view and be, you, using the list view and using these query operations is what we're saying is, hey, what we want you to do is we want you to basically take all the invoices and separate them by customer. Now, typically in a bigger company, of course, all right, I mean, I mean, imagine a place like a Walmart or whatever, you know, you're going to have multiple invoices from the same customer, not just from two customers here like we have here. All right, but that's our interface. So it says the list in this form is displayed in a list view control. It says you may want to refer to the online documentation to find out how it works. Well, I can't go into the online because it doesn't work with what I'm working with. But if I come in here and I type in C sharp list view, one of the things that's going to come up right near the top is going to be the learn from Microsoft right here. And if I go there, it'll show you the list view class and examples of using it. And if you don't like that, you can look at it. Usually you, you, you get something like this, like a list view in C Sharp from C Sharp Corner, and they show you how to set it up too. That's what it looks like. It actually looks like a really big text box. It's kind of what it is. All right, but notice what you can do in here. It has what on the top of it, what's called a smart tag. That's that little arrow that you see where I'm putting my mouse right now. All right. And if you click on that smart tag, it's going to bring up something like this, where you're able to come in and, and have some control over what gets listed, the order in which it gets listed, et cetera. And that's what they're talking about in here. All right. Again, it might not totally make sense, and it's totally, it's, it's, it's okay if it doesn't. <clears throat> All right, and then they just talk about how they scale it and stuff to make it look nicer on the page. That's not that big a thing, to be honest with you. All right, so they go and explain in here how you set the list view control up. It's not going to make a lot of sense until we do it. The example that I showed you a little bit earlier today, if you remember, I showed you, I think it was this one. Let's see. Yeah, that's a list view. So when I come in here, these are the titles. And I had to do a little bit of monkeying around, but not a lot. So if I say, show me the songs by artist, you can see how they line up. All right. And that's what we're going to start working with. And we'll continue to work with that, not just in chapter 18 here, but in chapters 19, 20, 21, and 22 as well. All right. So it just bring, it's bringing a little semblance of order, you could say. All right. And then they show you the code for it. And again, I'm not saying it's hard. I'm not saying it's easy. It's something new, so it's fairly difficult. 
Well, what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to jump into this and I'm going to show you not here. Now, I, I've said this earlier in the semester. OK, I got an email from one of you last week. You might be online now. You might not. And either way, it's OK. But somebody's saying that, you know, there's a hell of a lot of work in this class. And again, there is. As I mentioned to you last week, and I'll, I'm just going to keep beating the same drum today. This class is worth 14 credits. When I taught at another institution, our classes were all three credits, but students were required to take four or five of those classes each semester. Well, what we're doing here is we're just separating our program into four classes, and those classes, when we've had meetings like our advisory committee that we I, I mentioned to you earlier, they're the kind of things that people have said they want us to be teaching to make you viable for employment here. But what I'm getting to is, yeah, there's a lot of work. But there's a heck of a lot of stuff to teach you as well. I mean, we're 601 pages now into a book. The book has about 800 or so pages in it. All right, so we still have after this chapter and after 17, we still have four more chapters. All right, now. At the end of each chapter, they have these exercises. You say, well, I don't have time to even do it yet. Hey, if you're not understanding things, these are a good thing for you to go back to. Why? Because the stuff that you were given at the beginning of the semester when I gave you that GitHub repo with all the information on it, You've got the answers to every one of these. You've got the before and after pictures. What I've been doing this semester is I've been going through the before and after pictures. All right, on the extra exercises, and that's what I'm going to do right now. All right, so we're going to go into 18. But this is what's going to happen. So when you take a look right here. And I've I've made this a little bit bigger so it's easier to read, but hopefully you notice at the top of the screen you've got a drop down list. And when you click the drop down list, it's going to say all. Then it'll have another one that says under 10, like it's shown here. Then there'll be one that'll be like 10 and between 10 and 50. And then there'll be another one that will be greater than 50 or something like that. All right. Right now, if you run the program, the only thing that's operational is the all. That's it. But they want you to make it operational so you can do the other things that are in here. So it says take a look at the starting code. We will in just a minute. All right. But I don't want to sit there. I don't want to take until 11 o'clock lecturing today. I want to be done ideally by closer to 1030. Why? We have a lot of people who are struggling to keep up in here. And I want to dedicate as much time to lab time as I possibly can. All right. So if we look at the before picture here, let's see, I'm, I'm just going to grab this for you. So let's see. And um, where did I put that? Right there. OK. So if we look right here, this is the before picture. It says starts. So here is chapter 18, the one we're looking at right now, inventory maintenance, and I'm going to bring it up. All right, so if we run this, it looks like that, but you'll notice if instead of all, if I choose under 10, it doesn't change. If I choose 10 to 50, it doesn't change, and over 50, it doesn't change. I can put a new item in, so I can add an item. All right, so let's say two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, and it'll be some new item. And let's say that it's expensive. It's $399. All right, and I click save. All right, it says, Price must be a valid decimal value. I can't put a dollar sign on there. That was on me. All right, so save, and there it is. So that worked, and I can come in here and I can grab that item. 
and I can delete it. And that works. I could delete any of these. That all works. All right. But like I said, this doesn't work. That isn't working. So that's what we're asked to do in here. All right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the final copy and, and we're going to go over that. All right. Not not spend a long time on it, but just a little bit. I've got a bunch of copies of this that I was working on. Hopefully I'm giving you the right one here, so we'll see in a second. All right, so it's coming up like this. All right, and right now it looks like there's nothing in here, so let's add a few things. All right, so item number one, two, three, four, five, six. New item number one. And we'll say that that is $8.99. Save it, and you can see it's in there. All right. So let's add, in fact, this is wrong. Let me let me go back. I think I brought up 17 and not 18. Yes, I did. All right. I was wondering why it looked a little funky. So let's bring up 18. All right. So this is the actual working one for Chapter 18. We're going to go back and take a look at the code for it in just a moment. But when I run this, Now what you notice is, notice we got 795, 695, 1295, and 8995. If I say, show me the ones under 10, all right? Oh, I thought this was the working one. Maybe it's not, but we're going to get it in just a second anyway, all right? And it should be showing me the one that's under, just the ones that are under 10, all right? This looks like a before picture, not an after picture. So I guess we'll have to write that. Okay, then let's do that. All right, so what do we want to do? Well, the actual stuff that we want to do is shown in here. Now it's a little small, so let me make it bigger. Stretch that out, stretch that out. All right, in this exercise, you'll use link to update the inventory maintenance app. All right, so it displays the inventory items in alphabetic order by description, and so it can filter by price. All right, so open the project up. I already did that for you. So I opened it up and I showed you what it looked like. Okay, display the code for the inventory maintenance form and review the code that loads the item into the combo box and the code that executes when the selected item and the combo box has changed. Well, let's look at that. So this is in the inventory maintenance. So that's in FRM inventory maint. That's this one. All right, so let's view the code. I guess that was the one we were at already, and that's fine. So what do we have in here? Well, when it loads, we're calling get items. We're telling it to get everything. Hopefully you've noticed that, or you will notice, that when we run this and we get out and run it again we'll have we'll still have values in there so what we're what we're gravitating or navigating towards in here is data persistence we're looking at it now by using link and in chapter 17 you look at data persistence using files so we want to call this get items but where is that well, I'm looking in here and I don't see it and I don't see it and I don't see it and I don't see it, which means it's not in there. It's someplace else. So let's look. And is it in here? Is it an FRM new item? I don't think so. There's a save, there's an is valid data and a cancel. Well, there's also an inventory db.cs. Is there a get items in here? And there it is. Now, this is using material from Chapter 17. Sorry, but I decided to change the order. This says using that file, open it up, basically. And it's iterating its way through there to open it up. All right, that's exactly what we want to have happen there. All right, so that's what we're doing when we start. We're telling it to grab everything we have and then load that into the combo box and also fill the item 
list box. Well, the item list box basically is going to fill up. So if we want to put a new thing in there, we're going to be able to do so. So this is what's in that combo box right now. All under 10, 10 to 50 and over 50. You've seen that, that works. So that's loading, like I said, the combo box. So that is loading this right here. All right. But we also want to fill up everything in the list box. So that's what we're doing here. All right. Now it tells us to do some stuff in here, change this, do this, et cetera. We'll do that in just a second. All right. This is going to allow us to add. This is going to allow us to delete. All right. Exit. All they put in there was a this dot close. All right. And notice CBO filter by change, uh, selected index changed. This says that every single time you choose a different thing in here, update this accordingly. So add should show you all four or five. Under 10 should show you just those two. Over 50, there was one for 89.95. So just show the one. All right. All right, so I'm going to attempt to do this, and I don't have the code here, but we're going to attempt to see if we can do it ourselves. So let's take a look at what it is we're supposed to do in here. All righty. All right. So ran the app. It says, notice nothing happens when you change these selected items and exit the app. Add code that sorts and filters the inventory items. So let's just do this in order. I'm on step four now. Find the fill item list box in the inventory maintenance form. The fill item list box, all right, in the uh, inventory maintenance form. It says it starts by storing the selected value of the combo box in a variable named filter. And it declares a local collection of inventory items named filtered items. It says this local connection, collection rather, is of type I enumerable inventory type. That's because the link queries return that type. All right, so we're told here to code an if else statement, and I think it, it's gonna be kind of ugly, all right, that uses link to query this. So in other words, to tell us that if we choose all to give give us every one of them, if we choose under 10 to give me give me just, just the ones that are under 10, 10 to 50 to just show us those, and over 50 to just show us those. All right. So let's see. <clears throat> so we're in the fill item list box right here. All right. We're, we clear it out because we always want to start with a new list box. All right. We're basically saying. Make sure you've got a filter chosen. All right. And then we're setting this inventory item to no. So they want us to come in here and add this with a big if statement. So I'm going to put that in right now. All right. Now these are using query expressions, not those method based queries, which are a little harder typically for most people to understand and to write. All right. So we're going to come in here and put it, put these in like this. So if our filter is equal to all, that means again, we want to see everything. All right. So I'm going to put in here. Filtered items. Equal and now I'm going to write the query. All right, and I'll put it. It's going to be on. Whoops, not there. It's going to be on multiple lines. Remember, they always start with from. And they're always going to end with select or group. And we haven't talked about group. So every one of these is going to end with a select. So from item in items, order by item dot description, select, oops, select item. That says, give me all of them. That's like doing a select star that we looked at before. So that's that's what we have in there now, all right? But we also wanna do the other ones. So else if filter 
equal, equal, I think it was under 10, under $10. This is just a heading, all right? So if it's there, we wanna do a similar thing. So I'm gonna grab this for now and then make changes to it. All right, so filtered items equals this, but we only wanna do it where the item dot price price is less than 10. All right, so that's those. Else, if the filter is equal, equal to, uh, what was it, 10 to 50, I believe. All right, again, I'm going to just copy this in and make some changes to it. All right. So now what I want to say is I want to put another where statement in here, but previously the where that we put in was everything less than 10. Now I want to say item price is greater than or equal to 10 and item price is less than or equal to 50. All right. Finally, we had one more in here. All right. And that was for over 50. And again, I'll copy this in. In fact, it's going to be more like this one here. So I'm going to copy this one. Oops. Yeah, I can grab that. That's fine. And now I'm going to say price greater than 50. Now, there's a way we could do this with method based as well. What I'll do is I'm not going to go through that right now, but I will put underneath here, I'll put how we would have done that in method based, all right? It's it's uglier for lack of better words, but I'll put that out there so you can see both of them. All right, so what did we just do here? We did this, so we updated the for each so that it loops through the collection rather, oh, we did this. It says you can use method based or expression based or, or query expressions rather, I used a query, expressions i have the method based all right someplace it's a little bit more complex but they'll be in there as well then next we want to update the for each statement so that it loops through the local filtered items collection rather than the class level items collection all right so we just put all this in and now we're looping through right here LST items dot items dot add item dot. I think that's going to work OK the way that it is. I think that's going to allow us to loop through it. All right, so let's see. Test the app to make sure it displays the items in alphabetic order and that the filters work. So let's see if it works. I could have left something out. I never do that purposely, but it's possible I did. So let's see. First of all, notice these are in alphabetic order, not based on the description. Whoa, that was interesting. All right, so let's see. I don't know why it jumped over to the other one right away, but it did. All right, so now under 10. Well, it's got them, it's, it's got those here, but it still didn't work. 10 to 50, that didn't work either. Well, and then that didn't work either. So we're going to have to figure out why those didn't work. All right, so let's look. Let's go back and take a look at the code. What I gave you was correct. All right, now it could be that the for loop in here is wrong. So we'll look. Ah, we're looking at items. That's looking through the whole collection. We want to look through filtered items. That's what we just did here. 
we just set up filter items there and there and there and there, but we weren't checking for that in here. So let's see if that made a change. Why that's taking so long to run today? Oh, no. Oh, good gravy. Come on. Could not copy. What the heck is wrong here? Good golly. I've got a working copy of this. In the worst case is I'm going to send you the working copy. All right, I think the problem might be this. Let's see. Since I'm working with a different copy, yeah. Oh, no, that is eight. That's eight, and that's eight. Doesn't like something that's in here. It's giving me these two errors. It says this is locked by inventory maintenance. Well, then let's do this. Let's do a file, save all. Let's totally quit this and bring it back up again. All right, I already think I know what the problem was. I think I already had it open and I opened it again. I think that's what the problem was. So let's check, see if now we get any errors when we run this. All right, so under 10, there we go. And it's in the alphabetic order. 10 to 50, there we go. And over 50. So now everything's working. So in order to get that to work, we had to come in here and rather than using items, which was everything, we created filtered items, where for all we copied in all the items, for under 10, only those with a price under 10, with 10 to 50 with a price greater than or equal to 10 and less than 50, and over 50 where the price was greater than 50. Then we had to change this from items to filtered items. All right, so we've got all that working. All right, so run the app and click delete. Notice that the confirmation method message identifies the wrong item for delete. Click cancel and exit the app. So let's look at that. All right, so small or snail pellets, delete item. And it says, do you want to delete Japanese red maple? All right. The reason that it's doing this is it's doing this in the order that it was put in originally, but we came in and put a filter on there so that we change the order here to be an alphabetic order based on description. Now I'm going to say no. I don't want to remove any of them. All right. But just so you see that. So it says display the delete button. Event handler in the inventory maintenance and comment out the line of code that uses the selected index. All right, so again, in our in our delete button, we're gonna have to make some changes. All right, so it says comment out the code. I should have kept that here, so. Comment out the code that uses the selected index to get the selected inventory item object. Let's just write this the way that it's supposed to be written. So let's see. Int i equals items dot selected index. If it's negative one, give us a message box because we haven't selected anything. That's good. Else, all right, this is the one we don't want. So we're going to comment that out. All right. Now it says string message. Are you sure you want it? Well, of course, we have to change this because we were referring to item there. And now we don't have any reference to item, so we're getting this error. So let's fix that. All right. And I will comment this out. And we're going to change this to string display text equals LST items dot items 
I dot two string. Now we're grabbing the right one. I want to say that again. We're grabbing the one based on its current position. Now notice that we're getting here the green underline, and it's saying converting no literal or possible, so it's telling us it might not work. If we want to tell it that's okay, we put a question mark at the end. All right, and that removes that warning. All right, now where we've got all this stuff in here, okay, I'm going to at least this, I'm going to comment this out for right now. All right, and I'm just going to keep writing. So, Inventory items. Inventory item. Item equals items. All right. Now, let's write this one. We will use the method base so you can see what it looks like. Dot where item All right. Give me an error here. Hot item right there. Question mark in there. Got that there. Inventory item item equal items dot where. That should be item. There we go. We're doing the same kind of thing, but we're using a method based query. In other words, rather than saying. Select. Or I'm sorry, rather than saying. Uh, from items where item dot get display text equal display text select item. All right, so this is another way of writing that. All right, so again, we want to say, are you sure you want to delete this? In fact, we've got that up here. Are you sure you want to delete that item? All right, and we've got our dialog result. Okay. And if the result is yes, remove it. Let's see if that worked. So file, save all. Remember when we did this before, let's add a new item. All right, this is some, uh, it's gotta be a number. Some new item. And we'll make it $200. And click save. You can see under all, there it is. Okay. It's also in alphabetic order. It just happened to work that way. And if we go to over 50, it's now in there. Now, if we click it and we click delete, it says, do you want to remove some new item? Yes. And let's double check. So let's go back to our under 10 and let's go to here. Heck, let's go to all. And when we did this one before, it said Japanese red maple. Now it says snail pellets. So what we're doing is we are, when we used items, what they had there before, they were saying, look at the original order that it was put in the file. But now we're saying, no, we don't want it in the original order. We want it in the order it's currently in. All right, so let's see. Yep, we did all this. Run the app, this time confirm, yes, we did everything that's in here. 
Again, you'll get a copy of this. I'll be more than happy to save it. All right, and I'll double check and make sure that it works, etc. All right, so with that said, I'm going to jump back then into chapter 17. Now, I don't mean to demean the meaning of files, but I believe that most places, most companies, etc., would tell you that to them, working with databases is much more important than working with standard files. All right, but just like databases, files have a sense of permanence to them. This chapter will talk about the intro to the system.io classes. What that means is whenever you're going to be working with files, you'll want a using statement in there that says using system.io. There are text files and there are binary files. Right now, right now, I am reading this file. This is a binary file, but I'm reading it with a special editor. You've seen this kind of thing before. I've shown this to you, that if I come in here and for instance, this is the program we just looked at for chapter 17, okay? And if I come in here and let's say I go to this, uh, project file here. I may or may not be able to open it with something like, I don't know, Notepad. All right, I think I can actually open it up in here and it still shows, but, and again, you've seen this kind of thing before. Here is a, we're gonna talk about this, but this is gonna be our portfolio project. If I try opening this one up, and I open that one up in Notepad, it looks like a bunch of garbage because this is a binary file, so it's meant to be read in a particular editor, all right? When you work with text files, non-binary, which is what most of this chapter is about, you can read those with a regular text editor, all right? So that's what, what we're gonna talk about first, and a couple pages that talk about the binary, all righty? So as it says in this chapter, you'll learn how to work with file input and output, also known as file I.O., within the confines of text files and binary files. It says text files are preferred whenever possible. They're more portable and they're less platform dependent. In other words, you should be able to read a text file in any editor. You should be able to read a text file on any platform. So whether whether you, if you created uh, one here and I wanted to go and use it, but I wanted to use it in um, <clears throat> on a Linux machine or on a Mac or whatever, it should still work just fine. That's what they're talking about. Okay. So as it says, the system.io namespace has a bunch of stuff for working with these. All right, let's take a look at the examples. Hopefully, Looking at these, most of them make sense. Directory, as it says, allows you to run the, the basic operations on a directory. A directory is the same thing as a file folder. All right, so if I right mouse click in here and I choose, uh, I actually, I can do it from here, and I just come in there and do, you know, whatever, like control panel or whatever in here. All right, there is a list of all the different folders, et cetera, that I have in here. So a directory is a folder. A file is, you know, these directories hold either other directories or they hold files. All right, the way that you get to something that's in a directory is by using its path. So again, if you look in here, just as an example, if I take this file and I right mouse click on it, and I go to properties, it shows in here, here's the path to that file. It is C colon backslash users, backslash JP Scott, backslash desktop. That is the path to the file that is called portfolio project semesters 01 or 02 dot doc right there. All right, 
So when you want to work again, typically with text files, these are what you're going to be using. Now, when you work with a directory, you better make sure the directory exists before you try to do manipulations in there. So the exist does that. It returns a Boolean, meaning that if you give it a path, if that directory exists, it'll return true. If it doesn't exist, it'll return false. If it returns false, you can always create a directory. If you want to get rid of a current directory, you can do that. But notice, when you use just delete, the directory must be empty. If it has things in it, you must use a recursive direct uh, delete, which means create everything right underneath there and everything right underneath there and everything right underneath there, etc. So these are some of the methods that you'd use working with files. Check to see whether or not a file exists. Be able to delete a file, copy a file from the source to the destination, or move a file from the source to the destination. When you look at the code examples in here, notice how they set the directory up. And then they're saying if for some reason it didn't work, try to create it. Or if it doesn't exist, create it. And then they use some of the, the different uh, file methods in here also. Again, you will be using the using dot system dot io when you're working with files. There'll be different things that we're going to use when we start to work with databases. All right. Now, whether you work with a text file or you work with a binary file, you use something called a file stream. All right. The difference between these is if you look at that second paragraph in the third paragraph here, it says when you work with a text file, all the data is stored as text characters, just strings. There's nothing special to them. There's no data types associated with them. But when you work with a binary file, there are data types associated with them. What does that mean? That means that if I am in here, all right, if I am in here, a simple text editor like Notepad, and it, if it encounters something like a tag for bolding, it doesn't understand what that means. Or italicizing or underlining, et cetera. It doesn't get what any of that stuff means. But if I go into a, an editor in Microsoft Word, it'll understand what those things all mean. Now, it mentions here, to handle the input-output operations, it uses streams. As it says, think of this as flowing from one location to another. So an output stream could flow from example, from a hard drive to your screen, or from your screen to a hard drive, either way. When you work with text files, you use text streams. When you work with binary files, you use binary streams. All right, it's just what does the thing understand? All right. Now, the, the, the example they give here isn't a great example because this is a binary file, but you can still read most of it. Sometimes you can. Sometimes if you bring up a binary file in a regular text editor, you can read some, most, sometimes just about all of it. All right. But here they, they distinguish between text files and binary files. All right. The key thing is right down here, that when you're working with text files, you use what's called a stream reader or a stream writer. And if you're working with binary files, you use a binary reader or a binary writer. Both of them use a file stream. But again, stream reader and stream writer for text files, binary reader and binary writer for binary files. All right. So how do you use this? All right, there's different ways, good, bad, or indifferent, because as time has gone on, all right, C-sharp has changed what you can do and tried, tried in their way to make it easier than the way it used to be. 
Now, you may or may not agree with that when you take a look at it. You may look at that and say, well, that isn't easier, it's harder. All right, but you can do it the old way or the newer ways if you want. Now, notice it says there file mode enumeration. All right, that can only be used if you if you got a file open for writing. Append means literally, I boy, this is the, the olden days, and I don't know how many of you either have ever seen a record or have played a record, but the olden days, you know, when we had our albums, let's say I wanted to listen to song five. I had to take the, the needle basically, either listen to the first four songs or take the needle and move it over to the fifth song. Why am I telling you that? Well, just like a needle there, there's something called a file pointer. And it shows you where you are, all right? It, it shows you where you are in the file. So at the beginning, the file pointer will be at the beginning. When you use a pen, it takes the file pointer and it moves it to the end. So that if you try to enter some more information in, it gets entered on the end. All right. So that's a pen. That's write only. Create. Creates a new file. Be careful with this one. Because if the file already exists, it takes the file pointer and it moves it to the beginning which means it's going to overwrite whatever was there. Even if you had a million records and you replace it with one. All right. Create new does the same thing, but it checks first to see if the file already exists. And if it does, it throws an exception. It tells you to read, you know, name it something else. Open opens an existing file. As it says, if it doesn't exist, it'll throw an exception. Open or create opens an existing file if it exists or creates a new one. Truncate is, as it says, opens an existing file and truncates it so it sizes zero bytes. Again, basically, basically, what it is going to do, all right, when you truncate is it's going to take the file pointer and move it to the beginning of the file. When you read a file, or I'm sorry, when you open a file, you can open it for read, which means read only, so you can't write to it. You can open it up for write, which means write only, so you can't read from it. Most of the time you'll open it up for read write, which means you can do both. All right, that's accessing, and there's similar things for sharing as you see right here. Also, when you open up a file, you should always close it. Now, if you don't close it, when the program ends, the file gets closed automatically for you. But it's still considered good practice that when you're working with a file, if you don't need it to be opened anymore, you close it. Now they mention here it says operating system level permissions may limit which file access and file share options you can use. Well, I mean, again, I, I always go back to an example like this. It's kind of like when you go into a bank, a bank teller can typically look and look at your balance and take take um, deposits and let you make withdrawals, et cetera. But if you say that you want to come in there and change the type of account you have or something else, they're typically going to say, well, you got to talk to a personal banker to do that. In the same way, when you work with files, there might be certain things that you can't look at or that you can look at, but only look at and read permission. So you can't change them, so you can't screw them up. All right. Exception classes. Look at these. There's three exceptions in here. There is a file not found exception, a directory not found exception, and an I.O. exception. Looking at those and from what we talked about in an earlier class back in Chapter 8 on exceptions, File not found exception is a more specific error or exception than directory not found exception, which is a more specific exception than I.O. Remember, you've got to put your most specific and go down to your least specific. So it says to catch any of them, you can use the I.O. exception. All right, but if you want special ones to let you know what happens, these are some of the ones that you can use. All right, so text files, as it says, 
to read and write characters in a text file, you use Stream Writer and Stream Reader and Stream Writer. This is like I said, where it's going to be a little different. Because if you look in here, not, not that bad. So what are we doing? We're opening up this file. All right. And we're giving it write access. All right, so we have write access, so we're able to write to it. This is not that different from what we've been doing, except this. When we do a write or a write line in our console programs, we're using console.read or console.write means show it to the screen. Here, instead of writing it out to the screen, we're writing it out to a file. So it's going to exist after the program ends. So as they mentioned, you can use the write and write line methods to write data to a text file. If the data that's passed to these isn't already a string, these methods will automatically call the to string to convert it for you. That's why this worked with the price, for example, without you having to even put a dot to string in there. You still can, it won't hurt anything. If the fields that make up the record are stored as individual variables, you'll need to concatenate these to construct a record. That's what a record is here. What is it? It's the code plus the description plus the price. Notice these are both writes, so it'll put a code in there. Then after the code, it'll show you the description. Then it'll show the price. Then it'll do a new line to, to go to the next line. And in between each field, there'll be the pipe side that's there and here. That's writing to read. You use the stream reader read methods. You notice there's several of them. Peak is a look ahead function. It looks at the next character. If there is one, all right, it's going to basically advance the file for you. If there's not one, it'll return negative one, which means you reach the end of the file. Read, as it says, reads it a character at a time. Read line, reads it a line at, the at a time. Read to end says, wherever you currently are, read to the end of the file. And we already talked about close. All right. So it's very similar to the example we just looked at, except rather than, than writing, we're reading. Now, what's new, and we can use this if you're using C Sharp 8.0 or above, are these using declarations. So this is another way of doing it. And there's really two of them. This is the using statement. Everything is all within here. Okay, so everything is inside of there. This is a using declaration. So in the using statement, you put the for each right inside of there. With the using declaration, you have it separate. And that's what they're saying in here. All right, this most people will tell you that this is a little, you know, that the using statement is a little easier to work with. If you don't agree, you use the using declaration. If you don't agree with either one of them, there's still other ways that it can be done. All right, so here's a class that works with a text file. Not that different from things we've looked at between here and what we've looked at in the past for class stuff. So what are we doing? We're setting up a directory, a path to the file. So the directory there, the path, and then their separator. Very similar to stuff, again, we've done in the past. Now, I'm not going to go over this next section because basically it's the same thing that we just looked at, except rather than working with a text file, you're working with a binary file. So rather than like text out, it's binary out, but it pretty much works the same way, whether you're reading, okay, or whether you're writing. Now, reading is a little more difficult because remember, these different types are associated with a binary file that are not associated with a text file. But the ideas between them are the same. All right, as far as how they're done. So that's it. So what I'd like to show you, and I'm hoping we can finish this in about 15 minutes or so, is 
the chapter 17 one. Now I know I went over that quickly. All right, and all you're going to have to do again from this, all you'll have to do is the um, written test. All right, there's no exercises for you to do. This exercise that's here, the one that they have you do here, if you look at it, I did not do 17.2, which was the binary. I did 17.1. So it says you'll add code to the inventory management or maintenance app that reads data from and writes data to a text file. All right. So if we look at this, we've got this. This is our new item, and we've got this. Where are you? There. So this is what should come up when we run the program. And you'll notice it does. All right. Now, when I'm looking on here, well, let's look. First, let's look in here. And I don't know. So it says here, inventory items dot text. For some reason, it's not hooking up to this. We're going to have to see if we can see why. All right. We're here. We have this right inside of our program. All right, but right now it's not reading that. It's not hooked up to that. So let's see if we can fix that. All right, so this is what comes up at the start. So you can see, again, a lot of steps in here, but we'll go through them fairly quickly. So it says you'll add code that reads data from and writes data to. Uh, this is, I put the wrong, <laughs> I put the wrong stuff in here. This should be 17.1. And it should be text file. I'll fix that. We, that you'll get it. So, all right. So that should be a lot of change. All right. So let's see. I think this is the right one anyway. So when we look in here, add code that reads each record of a binary file, stores the fields in an inventory item object, and then adds the object to the list. So, in other words, we should be able to do this. Now let's see somewhere in here. It's not hooking up. So here we're creating a new item. All right. So let's go back. I'm going to not try to confuse you here, but give me a second. So let me grab this. These are all of our steps here. Copy those to the clipboard. Sorry about that, but I screwed up. All right. That's the one we just did. And this is the one we're working on now. OK. So the inventory item, I'm going to get rid of all these comments because they're wrong. And I'm going to replace them with this because that's right. You can see how ugly that looks. So as we look at this in this exercise, you'll add code to the inventory maintenance app that reads data from and writes data to a text file. All right. So first it says open up the inventory maintenance project. Well, that's already up. And display the code for the inventory DB class. OK, let's look at that first. We'll just do these step by step in here and see if we can get this to work. All right, so open up the inventory mate, and that's the one that's open now. Display the code for the inventory DB class. That is. There's our inventory DB class right there. OK. All right. And the next thing in there that we are told to do then. All right. The next thing that we are told to do is it says add code here. Add code here to read. Add code here to read the text file into the list inventory item. OK, so here's our path. 
we don't have a delimiter right now, so we have to let it know. So I'm going to say private const string delimiter. And that was the pipe sign. Right, so we're letting it know that 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 should be equals. So that's what we're putting in between each thing that's in there. All right. So we've got our get items. We create the list. Now it says here, add the code to read the text file into here. OK, fine. So we will create. The object for the input stream or a text file. All right, so using stream reader All right. Now, it's giving me an error here and I'm wondering if it is, I don't know, but I'm going to go back here, build project and go to my properties and see it is set to eight, 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 eight. That's good. So why isn't it finding these? Using stream reader. Generate class stream reader in a new file. Generate class stream reader, generate new type. I need the using system.io. All right, so using stream reader, we can call this whatever we want. This is going to be the input, so we'll call it text in, and that's equal to we need a new stream reader. All right. So we want a new stream reader in here, and what we want to do. Is in here, it looks kind of ugly. We say new file stream. And we give it the path. The file mode. which is open or create. And we want to open this up for reading. OK. So it says add code here to read the text file, and that's what we're doing. We are creating a new stream reader. And we are wrapping inside of that stream reader a new file stream reader. That's going to show the path that we set here. We're opening it for open or create, which means if it already exists, all right, we don't want an error, all right? And we're opening it up with read permission. All right, we're not done though. Next, we want to read the data from the file and store it in the list. All right. So while text in dot peak. All right. We never want to read past the end of the file because that can lock your machine up and do a lot of things that just aren't very nice. So while that's the case. All right. So while text in dot peak. Not sure why it's. Oh, that's got to be equal. Well, it's not equal to negative one. All right. Well, one thing to realize is we've got three different fields. We've got an item number. Then we've got a delimiter, which is our pipe sign. Then we've got the description. Then another delimiter. Then the price. All right. So we're going to set up a row. So this will be each record in here. So we'll call it row equals text in dot read line. All right, and I'll put in there question mark like this, which means if we try doing something and we don't fill in everything, just don't accept it. That's what this is saying right here. All right, plus remember we have three columns. And we'll use that split operator that we used in a different chapter and we're going to split it based on the delimiter. All right, that should give us three columns, but to be sure, we'll say if columns 
columns dot length is equal equal to three, then we did it right. We've got something for everything. So our item number is equal to convert dot two int 32 columns zero. It's the first thing that we put in there. All right. Not sure why it's, let's see. Oh, okay. It's equal to three. I'm, we want to say inventory item equals new, a brand new. Okay. And now inside of here is where we'll want to fill this thing up. All right, so there's our inventory item. That's the first thing that we put in. Then the second thing we put in is the description. And then the third thing that we put in is the price. And we wanna convert that to a decimal, not to an int. And we need to end this just like that. All right. Now, one more thing we want to do in here, two more things. First, we want to end our curly brace there, but we also want to add this. We want to add the current item to the item list. So items.add item. All right. That's part of it, so let's see what else do we have to do in here. All right, so we did that. Next. We want to add code to the get items method that creates a stream reader. I think we just did this. That's included. Well, we'll see. When we do this, the path constant should be set already. It says the file should be opened if it exists or created if it doesn't exist, and it should be open for reading only. I think we just did that. Next, we want to add code that reads each record of the text file stores each one, separates each field by our pipe character, and adds each one of these to the inventory object, then closes that. All right, we'll do that in a second. Then we wanna add code to the save items. That's basically gonna save it for us. All right, otherwise our data will not persist. Next, as it says, we want to add code that writes each inventory item object in the list to the text file and separates each one with a pipe character, then close the stream reader object. After we do all that, we want to make sure that we didn't break anything, so we want to make sure it works. Then we want to update the get items and the save items to use the declarations to automatically close the stream reader and stream writer objects, and then delete the statement that explicitly closes those. All right. Finally, test the app to make sure it works correctly. Well, some of this I've already done. Since we came in here and we set this thing up, all right, let's just see what else we have to do. All right, so in our delete, there's our add, all right, and let's go in here now because we've got to do stuff in the save and we have to do stuff 
in the cancel. Cancel is probably done, but I don't think the save is totally done yet. All right, so. All right. So first of all, in this thing, in this inventory DB, let's make sure everything is in here. So we added the code, we created, we read the data in, but it says in save items, it says right here, we are supposed to add code to write the list inventory items to a text file. All right, so let's do that. I'm going to put this on multiple lines. That's usually how you see it. So. All right, what doesn't it like using? Oh, we got to give it a name. We call the other one text in, so we'll call this one text out. All right, equals new file stream, and we've got path, file mode, create, and well, that's spelled wrong. File access dot right. Now, what doesn't it like here? So let's see. Very similar to what we did before, but before we opened up a stream reader with our path and we gave it read access. Now we're opening up a stream writer with a file stream with the path and we're giving it create and a file access dot write. All right, so paren. I don't know why that print is there. There we go. So that's everything that's there. Now we have to write out each item. And that's everything. And since we're using a using statement, we don't have to close it because it'll automatically close everything for us. All right, so that's that. I think we're finished with this. Let's look in here. So this is in our new item. So we've got our new item.cs and we have our inventory mate or maintenance.cs. And let's look at both of those. All right. I'm just looking to see if it's if it's if there's anything in there that it's telling us to do that we're not doing. I don't see anything in there. Notice we're using the validator class in here. All right. 
And finally, let's look at the inventory maintenance in here and make sure there's nothing in there. Let's run it and see what happens. So file, save all. Well, that's good. We've now established the communication link. So it is literally reading. I'm going to stop this. It is literally reading now from this file right there. All right, and to prove that to you, I'm going to run this and I'm going to add two new items. Let's make sure we get, let's see, a new item. We'll make it 5566. All right, there it is. We're not doing anything with, as you can see here, with um, like we did in chapter 18, where we put it in alphabetic order. Let's add one more. This will be Z item. And this will be 2233. All right, but it's in there. And what I want to show you is we've added these two new items here and here. All right, and if I exit and I go back to this file, there they are. So we have added them successfully. And if I go back in there, run it again, and let's just remove them both. And now you'll notice if we go back and look at the file again, they're both gone. All right, so you will get this. I'm going to save this right now. I've got a folder called EE 17-18. All right, and I will save that at the end of class. All right, I'm just about finished. Last thing is you are going to get sent this today, which is not there. Remember now in the homework, you only have to do the first two. Just do the letters that we did as a class and the photos we did as a class. I will be responsible for as soon as I can doing the bank login enhanced. All right. All right. Uh, that I don't want to go through now. So let's. Your labs. Oh, crud. I have to find it. Your labs for chapter 18 or the homework for chapter 18. I am going to send that out to you today. I was trying to clean this up before and I guess I moved it. There it is. All right, this is I'm not going to put them in order. This is what we're going to do tomorrow. We're going to create a searchable human resources database. We'll create an employee class that will hold for each employee their first name, last name, social security number, all right, address, okay? And we'll create a list of 20 of those objects. From there, one employee lives in Highland, Illinois, six live in Bellevue, Illinois, and 13 live in St. Louis. Then we'll create this. This is what I showed you earlier. We'll provide the user interface and we'll use link queries, all right, that will allow us to go and search for this in different ways. That's what we're going to do tomorrow. When we get done with that tomorrow, and this is mainly for those of you, what I'm saying right now, this is for those of you where this is your first class. So when we get done with this example, I'm gonna also give you this, which explains in here what you have to do for your electronic portfolio that'll be due right near the end of the semester. I'm gonna show you a free tool that you can download and it's all drag and drop. If you wanna do it that way, it's totally fine. I'm also going to show you tomorrow how to take that and put it out both on GitHub pages 
end out on Netlify. All right, maybe we'll even do that first. I don't know, but we'll go over that as well. So I'm going to give you this. I'm going to hand out. I'm going to put in in the email I send out later today, and I'm going to give you this. Then on Wednesday we will do this one. Create a searchable music library with a song class that has three fields, a string for the name, a string for the artist, and a string for the genre. And we'll create a list. I've already done it. If you want to put your own songs in there, feel free. All right. Provide a user interface for songs by name, artist, or genre. Then use the where clause in here with a drop down so we're able to look for different things. All right. This last one, I'm going to ask you to at least try to do this one yourselves. And that'll be a student grade thing. You should be able to build this interface with very little problem. It's similar to ones we've done before, but I'll want you to come in here and use link as they're shown right there. All right, I might give you some hints on that a little bit later. So the plan is we've now lectured on 17 and 18. Tomorrow we will do two things. We will go over your end of the semester elect electronic portfolio and we will do the first problem on here as a class. Sorry, the second problem. This employee search, which will be a console app. Wednesday, the only thing I have planned is to do this. If it takes us two hours, we're done at 1030. Thursday will be lab for the entire period. There are no classes Friday due to the Good Friday observance. And this work, these three problems, along with the written test for chapters 17 and 18 will be due by midnight Sunday, the 7th. That's going to get us through this week. Then next week, we'll start the database portion of the class. I do want you to know that next week, we will, you know, it, it'll probably be again that a lecture on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. And then um, or Monday, Wednesday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday will be a lab. But then we've got like three or four weeks left. All right. And I'm only going to lecture Mondays and Tuesdays. That's I mean, what I plan on doing. And then the rest of the time will we'll give you time to work on your homework. I will take through Thursday. Our last day is the third. So through Thursday, the second, I will take late work. Most of it you'll only be out, you know, only be eligible for 50%. But again, 50% is 50% better than 0%. All right. Last thing then, that's this here. So this is where we are. We did 17 and 18 today. We'll do a link practice tomorrow. And we'll do our, in fact, we'll do the other order. So we will do the e-portfolio instructions, demo, and then we'll go in and do that one link practice. We'll do the other one of three on Wednesday. Thursday will be a lab, and next week, like I said. But notice in here, I, I don't, I don't want to do it like this. What I want is I want this to be a lab, and I want this to be a lab. All right, and then the same thing here. So you're gonna have a lot of lab at the end of the semester, okay? We will be working on a project together when we get to chapter 20, and then I'm gonna ask you to create your own similar project to that. All right, and then that'll be it. All right, so I'll send out this updated rest of semester schedule, and I'll send out the uh, sheet for the electronic portfolio, and I'll send out your homework sheet in just a little bit after I get done with this. That's all I have for today, so I'll see you at 8.05 tomorrow. Have a good rest of the day. Thanks.